Work at the training school started again on Wednesday the 2nd of January 1991 and I was booked driving instruction with a driver from Slade Green and another from Victoria Eastern. It made sense to keep to the southeastern route so I commandeered a Victoria to Orpington service for the first couple of days taking them over to the southwestern division on the Friday. I also had both of these men on their traction exam the following week and although they passed their driving part they failed on their traction knowledge. I would always give leeway to a lot of answers given on traction questions, but drew the line if it meant that they might be in danger to themselves or others. On the same morning of their exam, Tuesday the 8th of January, there was a fatal train crash at Cannon Street Station where two people lost their lives and 524 persons were injured. The 0758 commuter train from Orpington, composed of 1951 and 1957 EPB units, failed to stop at Platform 3, a dead-end platform, and collided with the buffer stops at approximately 10 mile an hour. A report was compiled of the accident by Her Majesty's Railway Inspectorate, and no fault could be found in the train's braking system, and the inquiry found that the cause of the accident was solely that of driver error. The report also made some of the following observations. 1. The age of the elderly trains increased the effect of the impact. Of the two coaches that suffered the worst damage, one was built on an underbody dating from 1934, having been refitted with a new body in 1953 and involved in a previous collision with a locomotive in 1958. The other was built on an underframe from 1928. Further observations were the interior design of the coach's fittings and the large number of slammed doors could have resulted in weaknesses in the structure of the rolling stock. Automatic train protection, or ATP, should be installed as quickly as practically possible. On-train data recorders would make the findings of evidence easier following railway accidents. Legislation should be introduced to make it an offence for railway staff with safety responsibilities to be intoxicated whilst on duty. Arrangements for the booking on of staff should be reviewed. A recommendation also made in the report for the Eltham Well Hall rail crash. Regarding the training of the driver, a training manager at OTC Southside confirmed that there was no intermediate stage for trainees between learning the controls in a static vehicle and practical experience on a loaded train in service. And I echoed this in a written report to the operations training manager on the 20th of March 1991. The following day after the incident at Cannon Street, I had my first experience of training a female trainee. Remember that there weren't many female drivers at that time, and found her to be equally competent. She was accompanied by another trainee from Waterloo, and they were with me for the next three days. I can remember that on one of the Class 455 driving instruction trips, the railhead was particularly greasy, and as we ran into Putney Station, the wheels picked up. I immediately instructed her to place the driver's brake valve to the step three position and leave it there. She didn't panic and placed the DBV to step three. The blowdown valves responded and we came to a perfect stop in the station. I commended her on her action and it taught them both a valuable lesson when confronted with this type of railhead condition. On the 22nd of January, I was reunited with the previous two trainees, conducting their part two exam, which they both passed. I was then booked leave until Friday the 1st of February, and because I hadn't been on a class 319 unit for a while, I was booked a refresher day before taking a class 319 course starting on Tuesday the 5th of February. Our first day was on a static at Sellers Depot, followed by a driving instruction day when we went to Brighton. On the Thursday, the weather was bitterly cold, and as I drove to Woking Station that morning, the thermometer in my car was minus 7 degrees centigrade. It started snowing the following day, and we couldn't find a train to use, so we had to postpone the training and instead ran the course on the Saturday and Sunday. It was a bit of a struggle getting to sell us because of the snow, 
but I eventually made it. Snow still laid on the ground during the following week and it was nice to be in the warmth of the training centre conducting revision with TM1 course. On the Thursday though, I had to brave the elements and go to Clapham Yard for a part three exam where I'm pleased to say both of the trainees passed. On the 15th of February, Don Ottinen, one of the stalwarts at the OTC, retired and after work we went to the Red Lion to wish him a happy retirement and say our goodbyes. As mentioned, I'd known Don since I joined BR at Guildford Loco in 1961 and had fired to him on steam locomotives on several occasions. On Saturday the 16th of February, David Timothy, Ralph Sullivan, Eric Christian and myself went to Selhurst Depot to look at a new Class 456 unit that was going to be introduced onto the Central Division. On the Sunday, we were allowed to take the unit out onto the main line and went all over the place, each of us having a spell in the driving seat. The class 456 desk and driver controls are as follows. One, three-step brake controller. Two, AWS reset button. Three, door release buttons, left. Four, main res brake cylinder pressure gauge, five, speedometer, six, door release buttons right, seven, door open and close buttons, eight, master switch, and nine, power controller. On the week commencing the 18th of February, I should have started another class 73 course, but because there was a bomb alert at Victoria Station, the train services to London were in complete disarray. Instead, the course started the next day and after reaching a mutual agreement with the drivers on the course, we worked on the Saturday to regain the course element. Unfortunately, the following Monday's training trip from Eastie to Paul in return was cancelled, so we were back to being a day short again. The rest of the week went well, the training trip running from Eastleigh to Paul and on the Friday from Eastleigh to Weymouth in return. On the Saturday and Sunday I was booked a 319 course at Sellers with two drives from Victoria and three bridges. I then continued with the third week on the Class 73 course, going to Stewart's Lane for the final static day's training. For the next three weeks I was booked a variety of work, either assisting on static days or driving instruction, then another 456 course on Sunday the 24th of February. I was then booked to take two drivers for driving instruction and worked over the Victoria Orpington and the Waterloo Portsmouth routes. The training centre was having a refit the following weekend and this would take up until Tuesday the 2nd of March so we had to remove all contents from our lockers and desks etc. We reopened the training centre on Wednesday the 3rd of March moving all of our kit back into the new desks and lockers. For the next two weeks I was kept busy with either driving instruction on 1963 or class 455 units, varying the suburban routes to include Waterloo to Chesington, Waterloo to Shepparton, Waterloo to Hampton Court, Waterloo to Guildford via Cobham, Waterloo Main to Waterloo Windsor via Richmond, Waterloo Windsor to Waterloo Windsor via Brentford or Waterloo to Reading via Ascot. On the 17th of April I was booked 1951 driving instruction with four trainees and met them at Victoria to work to Orpington. The 0933 service was already being used by another instructor so we went to the front of the 1002 service and waited for the driver to appear. When the driver arrived I introduced myself and asked him politely if I could use his train for training purposes, the driver normally granting this request. Instead the driver was quite abrupt and said that I couldn't use his train. I asked him what his name was and the depot he came from, which was the normal procedure when a driver declined, and he refused to give me either. I then told my trainees to sit in the train and I said to the driver that I was going to accompany him in the cab to Orpington and showed him my green cab pass. This he agreed to at first, but then suddenly changed his mind by shutting the cab down and applying the parking brake. He then disappeared along the platform. After a few minutes he reappeared and told me to get out and stop winding him up. I repeated to him that I would be riding with him in the cab 
and I had the authorisation to be there. He then became very abusive and I decided to take him off the train and report him to the train crew supervisor. It ended up with the train being cancelled as there wasn't another spare driver at Victoria to work the train. I then reported the incident to my training manager. That weekend I was kept busy conducting class 4, 5, 6 courses at Sellers Depot and the rest of the week driving instruction using the Waterloo Portsmouth Harbour and Waterloo Guildford via Cobham routes, finishing up on the Friday working over the Wimbledon West Croydon line. As mentioned earlier, I like using this line to get trainees used to using the five position brake valve and to use the Westinghouse brake. I'm now looking forward to a break in scenery as on the 13th of May I'm booked to learn class 483 units on the Isle of Wight. Monday the 13th of May was a glorious spring day and I was on my way to the Isle of Wight making the crossing from Portsmouth Harbour to Ride Pier Head. I must admit I hadn't been across to the island for years and certainly hadn't been on any of the new class 483 units introduced a couple of years earlier to replace the ageing class 485486 units. The class 483 units had originally been built in 1938 and had already worked for nearly 50 years on London Underground and had been extensively refurbished at Eastley Works. I made my way to Ride St John's Road Station and met fellow instructor Martin Squibb who was going to show me the ropes. Martin had been born on the Isle of Wight and therefore, like anyone else that had been born there, was known as a corkhead. Alan Rackett from East Cow's Isle of Wight says, I was always taught as a child that this term originates from when a ship carrying people from the island along with people from the mainland, Oveners, sank in the Solent and the only survivors were from the island. However, a better explanation is that corkheads were hired at Buckler's Hard in Bewley as corkers in the boatyards. A local myth is to drop a newborn baby into the Solent and if they float unharmed, they are true corkheads. I spent the next four days on the Isle of Wight with Martin, not only learning the unit, but also the route between Ride Pier Head and Shanklin, where the line terminated. Most of the route consisted of single line sections with passing loops at various stations. On the Friday, Jerry Waite came over to ride to conduct my static traction exam, which I successfully passed, and was now ready to take my own course on Class 483 units in the future. The following week, I was booked two Class 319 courses running consecutively, which finished the week off nicely before a three-week holiday, which I was really looking forward to. On my return to work, I found that I'd been booked to conduct a Class 483 course for two drivers, and that John Hartford, another fellow instructor, was going to accompany me to also learn the unit. On arrival at Ride St John's Road, we looked round a static unit and then in the afternoon did some practical handling to Shanklin and Ride Pier Head. This continued for the rest of the week with another instructor taking the exam on the Friday. On the 8th of July, I picked up a second and third week of a Class 73 course and instead of working a training trip on the South Western Division, ran trips from New Cross Gate to Brighton and one day to Eastbourne with the normal static days being held at Stewart's Lane Depot. On the 22nd of July, I started TM11 course with two other acting instructors sitting in to learn the course structure and they would shadow me for the duration of the course in the classroom and during static instruction on all the types of EMU featured on the course. On Friday the 2nd of August I was waiting on Woking platform to catch a train to Waterloo and when the West of England train ran into the platform I noticed that one of the acting instructors I was teaching was in the cab of the class 50 hauling the train. I was invited into the cab to do the driving, a type of locomotive that I'd never driven before. The number and the name of the locomotive was 50002. Superb! and this was going to be one of its last trips to Waterloo before being withdrawn from service. A vacancy for a senior instructor mixed traction had been advertised at the school and I was encouraged to apply. Other interviews took place and I couldn't have mine until after my holiday so that was another time when I had to take my homework with me. Upon my return my interview took place, the interview panel being Tim Morgan, Ian Thorpe and Ralph Sullivan. 
and after a couple of hours deliberation, I was told the job was mine. As you can imagine, I was ecstatic. I was now a senior instructor with an MS1 grade. A manager of a team of six instructors and a dream I would have never have thought possible when I joined the railway as a 15-year-old engine cleaner at Guildford in 1961. This meant another increase in salary, but the drawbacks were that I had a lot more work and responsibility. On Monday the 17th of September, I was booked to instruct a group of drivers from Eastleigh and Bournemouth depots on Class 73 road work, a course that had been started by Cyril Sweet. The training trip would run all week from Eastleigh to Poole and return to Eastleigh and consisted of a Class 73 locomotive and two four VEP units. The 10-point control cutout switches on both four VEP units were cut out so as not to overload the traction current index. I thoroughly enjoyed the trip as so this was my favourite class of locomotive and it was an absolute pleasure to instruct the trainees on the correct way to operate the locomotive on diesel and electric conditions in a variety of ways including driving under auxiliary power using the electric controller. Apart from the EP electro-pneumatic brake being utilised, the Westinghouse brake was also practised. On Monday the 21st of October, I attended a British Railways Board workshop at a hotel in Scarborough for four days. The driver training programme was changing rapidly and objective writing was the key issue. The teaching process towards students was that there would be a key objective at the end of each lesson and measures in place to observe that the key objectives had been met. For the next two weeks that's all I was doing at work, looking through each part of the traction course and writing objectives. However, I was given a break from this task on some of the days leading up towards Christmas and utilised for a variety of work including 1963 and 455 class driving instruction with a number of Part 2 and Part 3 traction exams thrown in. I also had to learn how to operate the new Class 465 network of driver training simulators that had been installed. The new year of 1992 brought on a lot of changes to the OTC with a new prospectus and as I needed to hone my computer skills I decided to enrol in a computer course at Guildford Technical College. Up until this point all classrooms had overhead projectors with viewfoils and the occasional slide projector but now instead of the DOS based programs Microsoft Windows version 3 and N3.1 had been introduced at the OTC and this meant that it was possible to use scanned digital images in all their course material. Apart from that, it was also possible to place digital images into the training literature. As up until then, this had all been done using line drawings or pencil sketches. The first couple of months of 1992 saw me running two consecutive Class 73 courses, one of which the driving instruction was with freight trains over the southeastern division. On the first course we worked a freight train from Tunbridge West Yard to Dover via Canterbury from Monday to Thursday, completing the static instruction at Stewart's Lane Depot on the Friday. However, on the second course, on reaching Ashford, the driver refused to let us use his train for training purposes, which meant we had to try to find another train to use. This was easily accomplished by using Victoria Gatwick services, but only using a Class 73 locomotive at one end of the train made things awkward. We were lucky the following day though, the trip running from Tunbridge West Yard and return via the Medway Valley Line. On the 4th of March I attended another management course at Southampton for three days with some of my colleagues from the OTC, namely Mick Oakley, Trevor Sprague, Tim Morgan, Ralph Sullivan, Brian Cook, Martin Squibb, David Timothy and Gordon Farley. It was my birthday during the course and this was celebrated during the evening on the 5th of March with a birthday cake. My next task was to learn the Class 158159 Sprinter units and to start with I caught a train to Fratton where I picked up a Class 155 Regional Railway service to Cardiff with one of my team. I repeated the journey the following day doing most of the driving which gave me a flavour of how a Sprinter operated. Class 158159 units were going to be the mainstay of services from Waterloo to Exeter and a new servicing depot was in the process of being built at Salisbury. 
For the rest of the year, I had a lot of work on my hands. Apart from covering Class 73 courses, I also had to make sure that my team of six trainers were performing to standard, and this was measured by assessing their capabilities in the classroom or on static training or driving instruction. It was also my job to update the Class 73 Faults and Failures book and also produced the Class 159 instruction manual that were issued to drivers. And this is where my previous computer knowledge learnt at night school came in handy. There wasn't a day went by when I was either working on some project or other, and because I'd invested in another home computer, I did a lot of this work at home. In July, I sat in on a Class 159 course that Mick Oakley was running at Salisbury, and for the next two months travelled there to either take the course or to teach other trainers. Meanwhile, it was decided that I should lead the project of training all of the South Western drivers, Salisbury and Exeter, on the new Class 159 Sprinter diesel units that were being delivered. It was during this project that my mother-in-law passed away, and I decided to take my wife Pauline on a holiday to Australia for a month to take her mind off it. When I returned to work, it transpired that whilst I'd been away, there had been a bit of a change at the OTC and the Class 159 training program that I'd been running at Salisbury had been given to someone else. I objected, of course, but it fell on deaf ears. I was given another project, this time training drivers on the new Class 465 networker units. In the background, though, privatisation was looming its ugly head and the writing was on the wall for the OTC south side. The central part was the first to go under the new franchise and a training centre was set up at Croydon, taking with it some of the trainers. This left the southeastern and the southwestern sectors being left at OTC Southside. I had even been told that I would be moving to Croydon, but I wasn't going to be stitched up again. By this time though, my computer knowledge had increased a thousandfold and it was decided that as I'd made a good job of producing the 159 handout for drivers, I would be better utilised in helping to write the networker training manuals and handouts. There were two different types of Class 465, one manufactured by Brell and the other by Metcam, and at first they had so many compatibility problems it was untrue, and the units were always breaking down. The trains were also DOO, driver only operated, and the new technology was just too much for some of the older drivers, and as you can imagine, the sickness record at depots rocketed. Class 465 network of cabin controls. One, emergency brake button. Two, master switch. Three, power brake controller. Four, train unit fault indicators. Five, regen brake button. Six, main res air brake cylinder pressure gauge. Seven, acceleration brake rate meter, eight, speedometer, nine, speed set control, 10, stalk microphone, 11, radio console, 12, door release buttons right, 13, AWS reset, 14, PASCOM holdover button, 15, DSD vigilance treadle. Last days of training at Effingham Junction. From left to right, myself, David Timothy and Ian Verinder. I had also been given the task of training all of the traction inspectors on the Peritzi data recorders that had been fitted to all the new trains, including the 159 type that I'd been working on at Salisbury. Apart from that, David Owen and I were also writing the new Driver 2000 competency-based curriculum for drivers as well so it was quite a busy time. The crunch came when we were all told one day that the southeastern part of the OTC was going to move to London Bridge and I might have to move there. I wasn't keen on this idea at all as I'd been on the southwestern sector all of my working life and not only that, it meant that I'd be working on networkers which I hated. Even saying these words makes me cringe. In January 1994, we all had to have interviews with various bosses and my job was contested with another senior trainer at the OTC. He wasn't exactly a friend of mine, or most of the other trainers for that matter, for reasons far too numerous to mention here. 
After my interview, my work colleagues and myself were fairly confident that I'd get the job, and it came as a bit of a shock when the other trainer was chosen. I demanded another meeting with the head of the OTC, and he tried to fob me off with all sorts of excuses as to why I hadn't been chosen, and offered me a job as a troubleshooter between management and drivers at Victoria. I wasn't interested, of course. I didn't do a stroke of work at the OTC after that day and decided to take the severance package that was on offer. I only attended work for another two weeks as I had also decided to take the time off that I was owed. Friday the 18th of February 1994 was my last day on the railway and was quite a sad day for me really. My career within the railway industry had spanned 32 years 11 months but at least I'd worked my way up through the ranks rather than by grace or favour. I'd also enjoyed the best days of my working life with my colleagues at the OTC Southside and it was a shame it had to end the way it did. 20 years later, I attended a retirement party of a friend that worked me at OTC Southside and the person that conducted my last interview was also present. To satisfy my curiosity, I asked him outright whether he remembered the encounter. It gave me great satisfaction to hear that my suspicions were correct and that he'd been briefed beforehand to select the other trainer, even though I was a more suitable candidate for the job. I thanked him for his honesty and told him that it was all water under the bridge now and had I not left at that time, I wouldn't have experienced meeting and working with a host of other friends from other walks of life besides the railway industry. Here are some photographs of when I first started at the school at Christmas 1987. Firstly, the black and white photographs. In no particular order, they show Mick Bassett, Derek Gain, Dave Webb, Phil Eake, Bernie Byrne, Michael Gill, Anne Graham, Ken Norris, Ted Greavesherd and Colin Wood. This photograph shows Ted Greavesherd, Ken Norris, Bernie Byrne and Cyril Sweet. This one shows Graham Allen playing the trumpet and Colin Wood listening. And then Derek Gain, John Saville, Colin Wood attempting to play the trumpet and Mick Bassett. Finally, quite an assortment here. Phil Eake, Ralph Sullivan, Mick Oakley, Michael Gill, Derek Gain, Fred Johnson, David Timothy and Martin Bowman. Here are some memorable photographs of my work colleagues at the OTC Southside. David Timothy and Fred Johnson, Mick Oakley and Chris Lemon, Tim Reynolds, Richard Pike and his wife, my wife Pauline and David and Vivian Timothy. Chris Lemon and Cyril Sweet. Michael Gill, Ken Norris, Keith Twyman and Tim Morgan. Andy Smith, John Rutter, Dave Webb, Anne Graham and Chris Haynes. Dave Brown, Len Price, David Timothy, Graham Penn, Ralph Sullivan, myself and Cyril Sweet. Bernie Byrne and Trevor Harris. Tony Saunders, Jim Samuel, Mick Oakley, Chris Foote and Anne Graham. Trevor Harris, Tim Morgan, John Hartford, Chris Haynes and Roger Luckins. Eric Christian, David Timothy and Ian Simmons. John Parsons hands David Timothy his leaving present. David unwraps his leaving present while Tim Reynolds, Chris Foote, Tony Saunders and Mick Oakley look on. David looks pleased with his leaving present, a Pentax Zoom 70R camera. Next we have Ian Verinder, Pete Tyler and Chris Lemon on their way to the school. Ian Verinder and Don Ottingham. Len Price and Class 60 locomotive at Heather Green. Tony Harper and David Owen. 
Chris Haynes, Michael Gill and Pete Tyler. David Timothy, Bernie Byrne, Peter Johns and Jerry Waite. Ken Norris, Jerry Waite and Cyril Sweet. Mick Oakley and Alan Cook. From left to right, CNM and E-Man from the Sellhurst, Cyril Sweet, Derek Gain, myself, Ken Norris, Mick Oakley, David Timothy and Jerry Waite. Ryan Cook, Derek Gain, Fred Johnson and Mick Oakley. And finally, back row from left to right, myself, Tim Morgan, Bomber Harris, Derek Gain, Eric Christian and Bernie Byrne. Front row seated from left to right, Fred Johnson, Ken Norris, Don Ottinen, Cyril Sweet, Mick Oakley and John Rutter. As previously mentioned, I enjoyed some of the best days of my working life in their company.